Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Can you hear me okay? It was humming a wee bit there, but I think we're okay. Oh, that's louder. Right. Good morning. What a lovely morning uh, to come out and gather as we worship together. And good morning and welcome to everyone who's watching us on the live stream. Uh, whether you're watching just now or later on, it's really good that you're able to join us as we worship together. We're on the edge of getting some feedback, Andrew. I don't know why. We'll try it, try it through the notices, and if it isn't fixed by then, I'll switch to this mic, okay? One or two notices to mention. Uh, we've got our welcome space tomorrow, 10 o'clock, till uh, just before 12. Um, come along and join us for some chat and coffee and tea uh, or at our welcome space. We had intimated Cafe Church for Wednesday, uh, but we're having to postpone that uh, on Wednesday. Uh, the Kirk Session are having a meeting with representatives from the Deployment Committee of the Presbytery at 7 o'clock, and so we won't be able to do Cafe Church on Wednesday. Next Sunday, uh, we're having a pulpit swap I'm going down to St. Michael's, and the minister there, Andrea, is coming to do the service here. So please do come along uh, and support our service and welcome Andrea among us. Also next Sunday, um, we've got some news from our eco team um, about an award which we've had. So come along next Sunday uh, to hear about that. Two weeks today, the 28th of April, we're having a four congregations faith and food time at half past six at St. Michael's Church. So that's Sunday, the 28th of April, 6.30 at St. Michael's. Please come and join us for this time of fellowship and worship together. We are taking uh, as our theme for all of these faith and food events, the five marks of mission. And uh, the next one at the end of April, the theme is going to be mission and social justice and care for others. Please come along and join us uh, in our, our four congregations as we worship together at St. Michael's uh, two weeks today. The final notice I have is uh, to say, I'm sorry, uh, at the last hymn, you'll see me juking for the door, it's the stated annual meeting at Juniper Green today, and I have to go to Juniper Green uh, to lead their stated annual meeting. The, the good news is this is the last meeting that I have as interim moderator at Juniper Green. My turn uh, finishes at the end of the month, um, so I'm, I'm really pleased that that's now over, but I hope you'll understand um, when I dodge away today um, to go to Juniper Green for this stated annual meeting. <clears throat> Today is a good day for us to come together to worship our God, God who has blessed us with living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. It is good for us to fix our eyes on Jesus who is not dead, but is alive forever and together <clears throat> to worship him. We sing together, look ye saints, the sight is glorious.
Let's pray together. Awesome God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we worship you. You take our breath away when we consider your glory, the wonderful things you have done. We can only bow before you and worship your majesty. Sight-creating God, open our eyes that we may see something more of you. We pray for visions of your work among us, of your power and your glory displayed before us. Fill us with joy and hope as we see your glory displayed before us. Sight restoring Savior, renew our sight in your salvation. We give you thanks that you work wonders among us, that the victory of the cross and the empty tomb extends to us, that we are made new through your victory. Forgive us that we have mocked and denied you, that we have turned away from you, that when we could see, we have chosen not to. Forgive us for these and all our sins. May your cross wash us clean. Restore us to faith and life through your resurrection. May the new life of your kingdom be at work in us and through us, reaching out to all places. Vision-giving spirit, inspire us as we worship you. Fill us with new hope that your work will grow and multiply among us. Fill us with new hope that we might trust you to build your church and do great things among us. Fill us with fresh visions of service that we can offer in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Awesome God, be glorified as we worship you today. Hear us, Lord, as we pray. Hear us as we pray together the words which Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours forever. Amen. We sing together once again. Lord, I was blind. I could not see.
the next few weeks at this part in our service, we're going to think about this question, what kind of church? What kind of church is God growing among us? Why do we learn things? We all learn things. There's no point in, in, in denying that, but why? Why do we learn things? There are some things we need to learn. How to cook and how to clean. It is basic. <laughs> it's, it's, it's we need to know how to put the fish and chips in the oven and when's the right time to bring them back out and, and every now and then to run the hoover over the floors. We need to learn these things. There are things we want to learn. <clears throat> Some of us want to learn how to drive. Some of us never want to learn how to drive, but they might want to learn a foreign language, how to speak to folks in German or French or Spanish or, or whatever it is. There are things that we can choose that we want to learn. <clears throat> and there are some things we enjoy learning. Perhaps we enjoy learning to play music or learning about the music we listen to or learning to play some game, perhaps bridge or chess or, or some other game. And we enjoy learning. I know for some school pupils, the thought of enjoying learning seems very strange. But for many of us, learning new things is, is really something we enjoy and look forward to. <coughs> for a whole year, the church met uh, together with the apostles and taught great many people. The church was a teaching church, and the members of the church were taught and were learning things. It wasn't just a roll up and that's the end of it. There are things that we need to learn about Jesus and our life of faith. There are things that we want to learn about Jesus and our life of faith. And we enjoy learning more and more about how much God loves us. The kind of church that God is growing among us is a church which learns so that it can teach others. <clears throat> it's not possible to teach someone something that you haven't learned and so we learn. We learn about our own story. What does it mean for us to say that we believe in Jesus and that we are following him? We need to learn that because we need to know how to follow Jesus. We want to learn that because we want to do it so that we might honor him. And it turns out when we learn about Jesus, we enjoy doing it. We are a learning church. There are good things for us to learn together. We're going to sing once again, Spirit of God, unseen as the wind, gentle as is the dove.
our reading today is from John chapter 21, and we're going to read from verses 15 to 19. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. He said to him, Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This, he said, to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. Amen. Thanks be to God. Just before we come to pray together, It's not often now that I get to pray two Sundays running, but it's happened the last two weeks. And as I was preparing through the week, I I was trying to think, we want to pray for something different. We don't just want to keep praying for the same things every week. And then an attack happened overnight uh, on Jerusalem, and you think to yourself, we really need to pray for the same thing every week. And maybe it's good just for me to take a moment to say there are some things we need to pray about over and over and over again. And even though we don't know the answer and we can't tell God what to do about it, even if all we're doing is saying, Lord, help, we need to pray the same thing over and over and over again until God answers. We need to pray and not give up. Let's pray together. Gracious God, we give you thanks at this time and in this season for the good news of the resurrection of Jesus. We thank you that in Jesus you have given us all your promises made yes in him. You have been so generous to us. We pray that you would give us generous hearts, that we would give to you not just a little in a measured way, but that we would be generous in our giving to you. We thank you for the gifts we've brought today for other gifts we give in different ways. Receive all these things we give to you for the glory of your name. Father, we we do cry out to you for the situation in Israel and Gaza, for the situation folks are facing today in Israel as they worry about the possibility of further attacks from Iran. We pray for the folks in Iran who are waking up and worrying about the possibility of attacks from Israel. There is so much fear and uncertainty and suffering throughout that whole region. If we knew the answer, we would tell you, but we don't know the answer but we know that you love the people there and we pray for them. 
We pray that your hand of protection would be over people in Gaza and in Israel and in Iran and in Syria and in Lebanon and, and in so many other places around that region. <coughs> we especially pray that the leaders of those nations would be impacted by your spirit and your wisdom. That they would learn what is the, the right way and the right decisions to be made at this time to reduce this time of tension and violence in the Middle East. Father, we are bold to pray for our brothers and sisters in the churches in Gaza and in Israel, in Iran, and in other nations around that part of the world, that you would give them prophetic words to speak in these days, words of peace and grace that would impact their neighbors, that would turn many hearts towards Jesus. For in turning to him, there is hope for an end to this conflict. And Father, we do pray for ourselves. Keep us faithful in our prayers. Keep us praying and not giving up. Let us not grow weary in calling out to you. And we ask that we would not only remember this one situation, but we pray for the people in Ukraine after the destruction of a power plant. We pray for the people in Russia. We pray that you would give us the strength of your spirit to pray and to keep on praying until your glory is revealed in the nations of the earth. Father, we, we also want to pray and, and give thanks. We give you thanks for this time of school holiday. We pray for teachers that they would be renewed for all school staff as they return this week, that they would be filled by you with strength and, and with joy for this uh, final term of this session. We pray for the pupils returning, especially for those at the senior end of school who are going to be facing exams soon. Be with each one of them. Help them to do their revision day by day and to work towards their exams with good hope. Father, we pray that you would be at work in our schools. And we give you thanks for the Scripture Union holidays and missions that have happened over these two weeks, for the many children and young people who've heard of Jesus. And we pray that that word of hope would take root within them and grow into new life. And we pray for those who were Christian before they went to the, the holiday or mission, that they would grow in their faith and would come more and more alive in Jesus. Father, we give you thanks that you are at work among us. We do pray for one another. We pray for those we know who are unwell at this time. And we ask that you would be especially close to them. That even if they don't remember anything else, they would remember your love and your presence with them. We pray for one another that we would know your peace and your hope filling us day by day. Father God, look upon us. Hear our prayers. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing together once again. Man of sorrows, what a name for the Son of God who came.
Let's share our prayer together. Heavenly Father, we humbly bow in your presence. May your word be our rule, your spirit our teacher, and your great glory our supreme concern, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Winning has to mean something. When we celebrate the victory of Jesus over sin and death, this victory means something. Jesus has achieved his glorious purpose. Your football team can win the league one year and win the trophies and have an open-topped bus parade through the town and everybody can turn out and celebrate. And the next year, they can get relegated and win nothing. But not our King Jesus. Jesus wins once for always. Jesus wins and brings rich trophies of grace to share with his people Jesus wins, and his all-new kingdom stands forever. It's nearly a year now since the coronation of King Charles. And I'm not against the monarchy, but I do wonder what difference it has made to our day-to-day lives. It seems it's always been like this. Kings and princes rise and fall and come and go, and the lives of ordinary people go on and on, much as they always did. But not with our King Jesus. King Jesus conquered sin and death. He invites us to share in his victory. King Jesus has triumphed over our enemies to renew our lives. The victory of King Jesus is the transformation of your life and mine. In this precious story of Peter, we see Jesus very intimately applying this victory of the cross and the empty tomb directly to the life of his disciple. Today, Jesus, your victorious king, wants to apply his victory directly and intimately to your life. It's as though Jesus were inviting you to hear that story and to put your name in the place of Peter's name. Gordon or Mary, do you love me more than these? John or Irene, will you give your life to tend my sheep? Ian or Anne, will you follow me wherever it leads? What's your name? Jesus is inviting you to know his victory in your life. Peter is a disciple. He is a disciple who has stumbled. Three times in the courtyard, Peter denied even that he knew Jesus. But what about earlier that same evening? At the beginning of the story of the upper room, Simon Peter said eh, to Jesus, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus answered him, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow afterward. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Fancy way of saying I will die for you. Jesus answered, will you really die for me? I know more about this than you do. I say to you, the rooster will not crow until you've denied me three times. Peter and Jesus at this earlier part of the upper story uh, evening had been speaking about following Jesus, about being willing to die for Jesus. And the number three, three times had been mentioned. 
all of these appear in this story we read about Peter and Jesus by the seashore. The echoes with this breakfast meeting are ringing around for Peter, and they're supposed to ring around for us. Peter, who boldly declared that he would follow Jesus, has fallen, not just once, but three times, just as Jesus said. For a three times denial, the risen Lord Jesus works a three times restoration. Peter, it turns out, is not restored as though he had never fallen. His three time denial is overshadowed by Jesus' three time question. Have you noticed? Have you let it weigh heavily upon you? Jesus does not begin with the denial of, Jesus, of Peter. He does not work over again where Peter fell and went wrong. He begins, he continues, and he ends with an expression of love. It turns out that you can fall it turns out that you can stumble within an ongoing relationship of love. Don't husbands and wives, parents and children, close friends, prove this every single day? Peter needs restored to his own experience of love for Jesus. This is the victory which the risen Lord Jesus has won for Peter. Christ is risen, and Peter can love him. Christ has risen. We can love him. This is the victory of the cross and the empty tomb worked out in human lives, your life and mine. Don't we know that we failed him? Don't we know that? Don't we already know that we've denied him? That when he's tried to show us grace, we've turned away from grace? What we need restored to is love. What we need to hear are our genuine words of love for Jesus, spoken out loud to him. The victory of Jesus overcomes our denials, our failures, our weaknesses in the renewal of our love for him. It is love for Jesus that is the victory which overcomes our failures. Hallelujah. What a savior. Feed my lambs. Tend my sheep. Feed my sheep. If I might be bold enough to imagine what the, the risen Lord Jesus is thinking here, I do not think he intends there to be any distinction between feed and tend or between lambs and sheep. I do not believe the risen Lord Jesus wanted his church to spend centuries writing and talking about what the difference in these words might be. Restored in the victory of, of, of Christ, Peter and all the disciples of Jesus are restored by that victory to service. In the Old Testament, King David had many sons. One day, as these things happened, uh, one of the sons murdered another son, and then he ran away from home. It's regular family life. You see it on EastEnders just about every week. Now, eventually, David was persuaded to bring the murderer's son home. He couldn't bring the, the one who'd been murdered home. He was already home, but he brought the other one home. But you see, David refused to see him. I'll, I'll restore him to let him be in the city, but I'm not going to restore him to let him come into my presence. After two frustrating years 
of not really being restored at all. The son rebelled against his father, and thousands died in that rebellion. When we are restored in the victory of Christ, we are restored all the way. We're not restored part of the way. We are restored all the way. The victory of the cross and the empty tomb achieves real restoration. The curtain is torn in two. The disciples of Jesus now have access to his presence and the presence of the Father. You know you have been restored to your God when he sends you out to serve him. That's the proof of restoration. When God says, there's something for me that you can do, go and feed my sheep, tend my lambs, go and work in mission. Feed the hungry sheep who don't know Jesus. Teach them, tell them, share your life with them. Let them see how much Jesus loves them as they get to see how much he loves you. Feed the sheep. Tend the hungry lambs who need help on the way with your words of kindness, your acts of mercy. The grace of Jesus displayed in your life as you care for those in need. Tend the lambs. Work deeds of justice for those in need all around us. Restored to our fellowship with God, God sends us out to make Jesus known and to bring his blessing into the lives of others. The victory of the cross and the empty tomb is life-generating, activity-generating. It is not idleness. The heartbeat of the restored disciple is mission, service. There is work for God for you and I to do, and he sends us out to do it. In these words, Peter is restored to apostolic service. Go and do something for me, Peter. We give thanks to God that Peter answered that call, that he served in mission for the foundation of our church today is the apostles and the prophets, one of whom is Peter. Today, it is our turn. We hear the risen Lord Jesus speak these words to us. Feed my sheep. Tend my lambs. Open your eyes and see the opportunities for service I am placing before you in your own street, in the places where you shop and work. You don't have to cross the ocean. You might only need to cross the street. The victory of Jesus is our call to mission service. Hallelujah, what a saviour. After saying this, Jesus said to Peter, follow me. After saying the victory of the cross and the empty tomb restores your expressions of love for Jesus. After saying that the victory of the cross and the empty tomb is your call to service in God's mission. After saying that the victory of the cross and the empty tomb calls you to a martyr's death, after saying all this, Jesus says, follow me. We live lives surrounded by invitations. We call them adverts. We are invited to buy this car because it's always clean and shiny and wherever you drive, it's always sunny and it looks like great fun because you're going to the beach or you're driving in mountains or whatever it is. Accept the invitation, buy this car and your life can be like this. We are invited to use this washing powder 
because look, your clothes will always be clean and white. Isn't it wonderful? What we've been learning all these years, watching all these adverts, is that invitations should be attractive. We should want what is, is being sold on the advert. And what's being sold is not shopping powder or cars, but a shiny, bright new life. The invitation needs to be attractive. We should want to buy it or do it, whatever it is. Jesus didn't go to marketing school, and he didn't learn that lesson. Jesus calls us, invites us to come and die with him. This is the cost of discipleship. This is what restoration means. This is the victory of the cross and the empty tomb. Jesus came and died for you. And now he invites you to come and die with him. Jesus calls Peter to follow him. Follow him right now. Leave behind this hugely valuable catch of fish. Leave behind home and family and friends and everything you've known. Jesus calls Peter to follow him for every tomorrow, whatever that means. Jesus calls you. He calls us all to follow him, to follow him today, to follow him right now, to say yes to Jesus and enter into the victory of discipleship. Follow him every tomorrow, whatever comes. Jesus spoke to Peter about what would come, and it doesn't sound great. He doesn't so clearly speak to us, but he does call us to follow him. Follow him, whatever comes, and learn this truth. Jesus is with you, whatever comes. But you're only going to learn that if you follow him. Your words of love for Jesus are multiplied and returned in his victorious love for you. Your acts of service are abundantly repaid in his victorious life and death of service for you. Follow Jesus then. Follow him, whatever comes. Follow Jesus, and he will be with you. Let's pray together. God, our Father, we are humbled by your call to us, and we long to answer yes. When Jesus says, follow me, we want to get up and go. Strengthen us by your Spirit, that we would often say that we love you, that we would affirm to you and ourselves our deep commitment of love to Jesus. We pray that you would open our eyes clearly, that we might see the call of service in our life, that we would go and serve in your name and be a blessing to many people. In these ways, we pray that we would follow Jesus, that we would be his disciples. Bless us in this, we pray. Amen. We sing together, Rejoice the Lord is King.
let us go in humility that we might follow Jesus Christ our Saviour in the way of the cross and the blessing of our one God. Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with us all today and always. Amen. Amen.